Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight with praise, thanksgiving, and adoration for all the goodness of God that we have enjoyed today, the blessings of God that surround us, your presence that has made a difference, and we are very aware of that, Lord, tonight that uh, you have been with us today. We look back. The day's not over, but Lord, already looking back, we can see that you were there. Thank you, Lord, for the watchful eye of God and the hand of God on our life. We pray for these needs that have been mentioned tonight, Lord. I pray for Andy, that Lord, that the shingles would continue to dry up and that, Father, that uh, they be stopped in the name of Jesus. We pray healing over his body and you just eradicate that and that infection out of his system <coughs> bless his immune system help him to be able to fight it and God we just pray that you show yourself strong in his behalf pray for Jennifer Lord and the whole team that's going on this mission trip be with them that go and those that stay behind they all need prayer but Lord bless this this trip to Ecuador that it will be blessed of God and used of God and Lord that everyone that goes Father they're going to be a blessing but I pray you bless them as well Lord that I have a great impact and minister to these children in the project that they're working on on that school and, and Lord sharing their faith in Christ and working with children bless everything now everybody left home behind it's carrying on while they're gone bless them watch over them and uh, for the whole team, that uh, there won't be problems or setbacks, and the old devil won't get his foot in the door. But God, you will watch over everybody, those that go, those that stay behind. Pray for Dylan. Father, be with him tonight. And uh, you know his needs, you know his situation. And we just pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that, Father, you, uh, you deal with this, this parasite, Lord, that... Uh, Father, it would die out, and you do it in a way that you are glorified, and he knows that it's God who yes. did it. Father, we pray for Karen Wiseman's family that uh, diagnosed with cancer, and those that's going to be going to the hospital and staying, and those that's going back and forth for treatments. Father, all of them, everyone involved, Lord, whatever stage they're in, we, we just pray that God you be with them, help their body to withstand the treatments. Lord, we know, we know that it's an awful road to go down. To, but I, we just pray as a church tonight to, to be with them and help them and, and uh, encourage their heart and help them to fight a good fight and to hold steady and have a good attitude. And God, let them be a witness. Even though they're sick and fighting a disease, may they have a witness for Jesus. And Lord, would you bless him in spite of it. Father, I pray for Darlene. Lord, she is just right there as well. Help her, Lord. She's She's been through a lot and she's got a lot ahead of her. But God, when you are our, our guide and you are our, our uh, anchor in life, we, we just know that there is nothing that we have to face alone because you are with us. So God, be with Darlene. We pray that God, that all of this bad news will be turned around into good news and you minister to her heart and her spirit and help her be with all her families. They worry and watch and pray. And God uses this as a time to draw them all closer together. For Carol's name, Lord, we can only imagine what he must be thinking now. Lord, he was making plans to live and now he's been told he needs to make plans to die. Lord, I don't know how much time he's got left, but I pray that he would commit himself to you. And the Father, this time that he's got, that you make the most of it with the family. And God, that you slow slow it down and, and that he might live longer and enjoy life with his wife and family and all. And God, that you will just help him through this because he needs you. Father, all of us need you. We just pray tonight that you will minister to us and our needs as well. And uh, we, our needs are different, but, but they're real. They're our needs. 
So we lay them at your feet and pray, God, help us. And help us to trust you. And Lord, we just believe that uh, all things work together for good. So we just walk in that. Be with us as we open our Bible. Help us to understand what we're reading. Help us to grasp what you're trying to say to us. And Father, use this scripture to minister to us in a beautiful way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4. Where we're at tonight. Ephesians chapter 4. We have turned the corner. You know, I, I said from the beginning that Ephesians is like two different books. Chapters 1 through 3, long on doctrine. This is what we believe. Chapters 4, 5, and 6, there is a radical change. It's practical. It is no longer doctrine. It is now, this is what it, how we live out in the everyday life, how we live out what we believe. The two go together, same book. But there is a marked change. And you'll notice this reading 4, 5, and 6. So practical down to earth. It's not that chapter 1, 2, and 3 isn't, but it's all doctrine and theology. Chapter 4, 5, and 6 is. This is where the rubber meets the road and when you and I have to live this out in everyday life. Verse 1, how does Paul describe himself? He's a prisoner. Where is he doing time? He's in the big house, but where? You remember? Is he in San Quentin? Is he out on the rock? He's in Rome. Paul is in Rome and not much to do, but he writes letters in jail. And uh, normally they encourage us to write prisoners' letters and send them notes to encourage them. It's reversed with Paul. He's in jail, and he's writing letters encouraging everybody else. Still to this day, we're getting blessings from his letters. And he says, I beseech you that you walk how? Worthy. Worthy. What does the word worthy mean? Walk. Does worthy, mean? but... Walk. Counts for something. Appropriately. As becoming, after a godly sort of the vocation, walk worthy of the name of Jesus. I was thinking of a, of a story I, I heard 40 years ago. Now, I don't know that I can get it all right, but I'm going to try. But Alexander the Great was holding court, and somebody was brought in, what, sold or whatever, they would went AWOL. Alexander the Great was a magnificent warrior. He was all business. They brought in a guy before him, a dereliction of duty, and AWOL, and he brought him in, and he asked what his name was. And, and the man said Alexander. And Alexander said, what is your name? And he spoke a little louder. My name is Alexander. He asked him again, what is your name? He said Alexander. And then the emperor, Alexander the Great, said, change your character or change your name. He just could not stand the thought of somebody with his name being AWOL, a deserter. Paul says that you and I who are Christians walk worthy of that name Jesus. You put your faith in the Lord, you claim that name of Christ, saved, sanctified, maybe. You, you, you walk with Christ, walk worthy in a way that brings glory to him and to his name. 
Paul reminds them in verse 1 here, he's a prisoner locked away, perhaps in a very small jail. This is not the Hilton. This is not even the Holiday Inn. Jails back then were very small, cramped cells, cold in the winter, stifling hot in the summer. It's not three hots and a cot. There's no cable TV. This is no frills. The sanitary conditions were absolutely deplorable. He is in a very small cell. At best, he could do push-ups. <laughs> he could stretch. He could pace. And yet, Paul uses a word that I've never thought of like this, but he said, do something I can't do. Walk. <laughs> he is in a confined cell. At best, he can, he can turn around and walk a little bit, but he writes to people who are not confined. And he says, I want you to live and to live with the knowledge that you have a freedom that I don't have. Walk and enjoy it. Walk and be grateful. Walk out in the yard. Walk down the street. Walk to the seaside. Walk someplace. Walk and make the most of it. Enjoy what you've got that I don't have. I was told two or three weeks ago a story of a man that was, who was now dead, but when he was dying, he told his wife, who had been his caregiver and looked after him for a long time, he said, when I'm gone, I want you to travel. I want you to get out and go places. He said, you know, all our married life, we, we were always going to have, we always had plans for what we were going to go do, we was going to go see and take trips. He said, all we did was work and get the house paid for. And kids, grandkids, he said, never traveled, never went to see nothing. We never got around. He said, when I'm gone, he said, I want you to go see some stuff and have fun. I heard John Maxwell say a long time ago, he said, nobody, nobody ever on his deathbed says, gee, I wish I would have spent more time at the office. <laughs> nobody ever says that. Things spoken from one's deathbed carry a lot of weight, and you're looking at people reflecting on life and what's life's importance and how quickly it passes us by and what we learn too late. Paul has a death sentence hanging over him. Don't forget that. Paul knows at any given day, he could be executed at the will and whim of the emperor. So he's living with the thought of death every day, and so the words that he pens in these epistles, you know, 2 Timothy was his last, but what he writes here is from a man who knows that he is one, one moment away from losing his head, which he did. Paul says, I beseech you, I beg you, I am for you, please live worthy of the name of Jesus. The title Christian means something. Marion said that. It means something. It should be, have the highest importance in our life. It should be the most significant thing in our life. You love your spouse. You love your children. You really like your home. You love that truck. But the name of Jesus should be the most important thing to you in all your life. It should have the highest importance. It's an honor to be called a believer in Jesus Christ, but it carries a heavy responsibility. Paul goes to the heart of this right away. Verse 3 said, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. What does it mean to endeavor? To work and to work hard. I, I, does the NIV even use the word endeavor? It says make every effort. 
Make every effort. Strive. Push. Work and work hard. Put effort into it. it comes from a Greek word, spadezo, which means speed and effort put together. You, you're going at it quickly and you are not fooling around. You, th this has priority in your life and you are busy with it. He says, make every effort, endeavor to do this. Well, what are you supposed to be endeavoring to do? Verse 3. Keep the unity of the Spirit, and that would be the Holy Spirit, through the bond of peace. Maintaining unity of the body, and that would be the body of Christ, is at a premium and the utmost importance. And for the next 16 verses, it's all about that very thing. If you remember, we spent a long time working through chapters 1, 2, and 3, and he just kept hammering home Jew and Gentile are all alike, and Jew and Gentile have the same privileges in Christ, and Jew and Gentile are loved of God to the same extent, and Jew and Gentile are welcome into the body of Christ. And now we get into chapter 4, and he says, and this is how it plays out, <laughs> and this is how it's got to work. Jew and Gentile are to work together for the unity of the body. No one person is more important than the next. No one person is of no value. We are all to be treated with special care. Turn to 1 Corinthians 12. Hold your place in Ephesians. If, if uh, Marie gave you a bookmark like she gave me, use it. Put it there in Ephesians. And go to 1 Corinthians 12. Paul is writing about the body of Christ in this great chapter 1 Corinthians 12, and the church of Corinth really needed it, but all churches need to read this. We're not going to read all of it, but if you ever had questions about the church, chapter 12, 1 Corinthians is a good place to start. And we're going to look at verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Verse 14, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not of the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole we're hearing. Where would be the smelling? Well, it's kind of ludicrous what he's saying, but we all get the point. Verse 18, But now God has set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it pleased him. Verse 25, There should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Whether one member suffer, all the members suffer for it. Or one member honors, then all the members rejoice with it. Verse 25, the King James Version says, there should be no schism. What in the world is a schism? Division. Division. What do they call that in the Baptist church? A split. <laughs> Gee, there should be no division, splits, schisms in the body. Paul said that, you know, a long time ago, but it's still good preaching today. The body is important. And as a pastor, I have learned a long time ago that the unity of body is really important. Really important. And, and it, it, my job, I've always looked at it, is, yes, yeah, saving souls is important. That is our number one thing, getting people saved, sanctified, and, and missions and discipleship. That's all important. But, oh, by the way, don't forget the fact that, that 
this thing called a body has got to be cared for and nurtured and make sure that nothing is done where this person or that person says, well, you know, that hurt me. We go out of our way to not run roughshod over people, that we are careful about that. That is why the requirements for ministry set out by Paul in 1 Timothy and Titus is so, the bar is set so high for ministry is because there's a lot of stake here. The care of the body is so important that they're nurtured and cared for and loved and admonished and discipled and there be, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, no schism in the body. In verse 2, back to Ephesians 4, He gives us some words that are very important. And this is how that works. This is how this all plays out. With all lowliness. What in the world is lowliness? Humble. Humble. What in the world does it mean to be humble? Think of others first. Put other people first. Not prideful. Not, Not prideful. Boastful. Not boastful. You care about others more than you care about yourself. And uh, matter of fact, you'll do without to make sure others' needs are met. It's forever the servant. That's, that's humility. And you're not doing it for the wrong motives like our daily devotional was talking about this morning. I think it was this morning or yesterday morning. I forget. Loneliness. Completely humble. And then there is the word meekness. What does meekness mean? Gentle. What does it mean to be gentle? Kind. Unforceful. Unforceful. I like that. Tenderly. Tenderly. I like that too. So. Jesus was meek and yet he picked up a whip <laughs> and cleaned house, didn't he, at the temple. But he was still meek. He didn't lose his meekness doing that. Meek and lowly, riding on a donkey. <coughs> Means gentle, easy going. We, uh, we're careful about how we carry ourselves. Then there's that word long suffering. We've talked about that a lot. What in the world is that? Patience. Patience. Long tempered, meaning that you're you you hang on to your anger for a long time without blowing your lid. You 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 have the ability to Hold steady. Well, it almost sounds like the fruit of the Spirit, doesn't it? And then there's forbearing one another. What in the world does it mean to forbear? Support. Uh, putting up with give. one another. Putting up with them. <laughs> yeah. Tolerating people. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another, and what holds it all together? Love. Love. You see, that is the common denominator of all of that, of humility and meekness or gentleness and patience and tolerating. It's all done in the spirit of love, and they can feel it. It's one thing to grit your teeth and, 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 and smoke come out your ears while you're being patient. <laughs> but that's not love. It's another thing to tolerate them while you drum your fingers on the table and, 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 and roll your eyes, but that's not love. 
you see, we're supposed to do all this and love them all at the same time. <laughs> because we're talking about keeping the unity of the body. That, because it's important. 1986, two ships collided in the Black Sea off the coast of Russia. Hundreds of passengers died as they were hurled into the icy waters below. When the news of the, the disaster was further, it further darkened when an investigation revealed the cause of the accident. It wasn't a technology problem like a radar malfunction or even a thick fog. The cause was human stubbornness. Each captain was well aware of the other ship's presence nearby and both could have steered clear, but according to the news reports, neither captain wanted to give way to the other. Each was too proud to yield first, and by the time they came to their senses, it was too late. We see that played out in life. People just headstrong, stubborn, my way or the highway attitude. And uh, you know what happens in the world. That's awful, whether it's in the business world or in the neighborhood. That's bad. But when it's the worst is when it's in a church. Most church splits that I've been aware of had nothing to do with theology had nothing to do with doctrine, had everything to do with power plays and somebody's attitude and somebody got hurt and somebody's mad and I'll take my ball and go home and church is split. Now they dress it up and say, well, it was about doctrine most of the time, but the truth is, if you step back and look at it, somebody didn't want to apologize. Somebody didn't want to say, I'm sorry. Somebody didn't want to live by the golden rule. Somebody, somebody didn't want to be patient and wait on God. And humility is completely lacking. The goal is unity in the spirit. And everybody has to work on it. It's not just the preacher working on it. It's everybody in the church. Jew and Gentile alike, both of them are now saddled with this responsibility. They're in the church, and they're in the church together, but they both are responsible one for the other. And Paul says over here in, in 1 Corinthians 12, he said, it makes no difference. If one of them celebrates, we're all going to party with that one. And if one of them suffering, I don't care if it is a Gentile, and I don't care if it's a Jew, we're going to get right in there and weep with those that weep and mourn with those who mourn. There's a responsibility for all of us. In, in verse 4, he gives us a almost a creed. Well, not almost, it is. And there are seven things that we share in faith in common. Somebody read verse 4, 5, and 6 out loud. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Thank you, Beth. Paul reminds them there's one body. Yeah, we are different groups and house churches, but we're one body. We're some comprised more Jew, less Gentile. Some comprised more Gentile, less Jew. We're one body. It's not a black church. It's not a white church. It's not a church of the rich folks. It's not a church for the poor folks. It's not a contemporary church or a traditional church. It's not church uptown, church downtown. It's not church just for the elderly, and it's not just a church for the young. It's one body. And if it's the body of Christ, 
that's made up of everybody, born again believers, who have come to the Lord in faith, received him as their Savior, it's one church. Christianity is one of the most splintered groups there is. I mean, we just we will find ways to just Draw lines and divisions everywhere. But Paul in this couple verses here, one body, one spirit, and that would be the Holy Spirit that baptizes believers on the day of Pentecost and still energizes and cleanses his people today. There's one spirit and there's one hope of calling. And everyone who is a born-again believer has the same hope one day I'm going to die and go to heaven and be with Jesus. We have one hope. <laughs> I told somebody on the phone yesterday, and that one hope it gets us through some tough places in life. When you, when you know that you have the assurance that you are a child of God and you have your hope set on heaven, some days that's all it gets you through the day. And one Lord. Those who have been saved over here in Ephesians chapter 2 said, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You've come to Christ that way. He is one Lord and one faith. And then he says, One baptism. Most most people believe that he's speaking of water baptism here. That was the identifying thing. They have come to faith in Christ and are baptized. Now, we believe that there's the baptism with the Holy Spirit. But most people believe he is making reference here to water baptism. And one God and Father of all, the God, the Father of our Father, who is above all, through all, in you all, meaning this is my Father's world. We join in those seven things. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And we agree on that. We, we, may, we may disagree on a lot of things. We're, we are a different breed of people. We, we are alike, and, and we have a lot of dislikes as well. But we agree on that, don't we? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Let me read you something. I found this morning early, and I just chuckled. This chapter in Ephesians reminds me of a great symphony orchestra. When I first went to Nashville as a pastor, some friends asked me to go to the symphony with them. They thought they were doing me a favor. <laughs> but there are a lot of other things I'd rather do than go to a symphony concert. I am not musically educated, and I don't understand music at all. But I got a message at that concert. We had arrived early, and I noticed all the instruments. It looked like there was a hundred instruments. And over a hundred men came out from different wings, and each went to his own instrument. My friends told me that they were tuning up. Each one played his own little tune, and I'll give you my word, there was no melody in it at all. It was terrible. They quit after a few moments, which I was very thankful. And then they disappeared into the wings, and I could have went home. But soon, after a little while, they all appeared again. But this time, they were in full dress with white shirts and bow ties. Each man came to his instrument, but no man dared play it. Then the spotlight went to the side of the stage, and out came the conductor. He bowed several times, and there was thunderous applause. And then he picked up this little stick. He turned his back to the audience, and when he lifted that baton, you could have heard a pin drop in that auditorium. And then when he lowered it, oh, what great music came out of that orchestra. I had never heard anything like that that was more thrilling. It put goose pimples all over me, and it made my hair stand on end. Dale would say, that's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> After that first tremendous number, I began to compare 
what I was hearing with life on earth. Out in our world, every person is playing his own little tune. Everybody's trying to be heard above the clamor of voices, carrying out his own little placard or protest. Everybody seems to be out of tune, out of harmony with everybody else. It doesn't look very hopeful in our world today. And we look to the future with pessimism. Like Simon Peter walking on the water, we see huge threatening waves. But listen, my friends, one of these days, those are going to step out of the wings of the universe from God's right hand, the conductor. He is called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he will lift that baton, the scepter, with his nail-pierced hands. And when he does that, the whole world is going to be attuned. He is eminent. And he is transcendent. He is above all and through all and in you all. So don't give up. The conductor is coming. He will all get us in tune. I like that. Verse 11. Paul lists some titles that are used in the church, but they're really gifts, that uh, grace gifts that, that are given by the Holy Spirit to people. Everybody's got a gift, but some, you know, are apostles and some are prophets and some are evangelists and some pastors and from teachers. But in verse 12, he says, what is their primary role? For edifying Christ. Edifying? What else? The For the work of the ministry? What else? There's three things listed in that verse. Perfecting of the saints. Perfecting of the saints. Are we there yet? <laughs> I'm not. He's still working on me for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ. That's what those roles are all about. And they're going to be there until how long in verse 13? Until we all come into the unity. unity of the faith. Are we there yet? Well, we're, we're working on it. Unity is not the color of our clothes we wear or the vehicles we drive or the street we all live on. It's not in our diet or our hobbies or in our preferences of cold drinks. Our unity does not lie in the team we root for the movies that we most prefer to watch, or even my favorite dessert. What is our unity in? Christ. Christ Jesus. Go back to those verse 4 and 5 and 6. Our unity is right there. How many are driving a Toyota tonight? Can I see your hands? One, two, three, four. How many are driving a Chevrolet? Thank you, Jesus. How <laughs> <laughs> many driving a Volkswagen? Uh, four. Nissan. One. You start to get the picture. We don't all drive the same vehicle, do we? We can say that about the color. How many's driving a white one, or a gray one, or a silver one, or a blue one, or a red one? Or there's no mandate that if you come to this church, you have to drive a blue vehicle or a red vehicle. You know, there, there is no mandate. Our unity has nothing to do with the car we drive or the street we live on. The unity is in something in our heart. His name is Jesus. That is what brings us all together. And I love to go to Revelation, I believe it's chapter 7.
And this is in glory. This is in heaven in verse 9. And after this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb. Jesus Christ is what brings you and I together. That's why we're in church on Wednesday night. There are groups that try to enforce uniformity. But uniformity is not unity. Schools can enforce a dress code. They can have uniforms and everybody wears the uniform. That doesn't mean they have unity. company you work for can say all the employees have to park over here in this section. You can have uniformity, but that doesn't mean you have unity. It doesn't mean everybody gets along in the office. They all may all park over here together. That's uniformity. But it doesn't mean you have unity in the, in the office. The Amish can regulate what colors they wear, strict order what colors they wear, how long a dress is, that's uniformity. What color your buggy can be. How many colors do, you, do the Amish have of buggies? <laughs> you can have any color you want, just so it's black. That's uniformity. But it doesn't mean it's unity. What you and I possess in Christ, in the body of Christ, is a God thing. It's a beautiful thing. It, it, scripture says it's like it, it's like the anointing oil that's poured over Aaron's head, and it dripped down off his beard, down onto his vestments, and down onto his feet. It's the unity of the body. It's precious. Where we love each other, and we care about each other, and we pray for each other. And we support one another. And that is a precious gift. When you walk in the door, you know you're welcome. And you can raise your hand and say, pray for me because I have a need. And there's the freedom of the Spirit. You can say, in all honesty, a confession, I blew it. And nobody judges. but you're loved and you're accepted. That is precious and it's worth fighting for. Paul said, endeavor to keep that. Don't let anything ever come into the church body that would, that would ruin that. The world has some initials called DEI. Anybody know what they stand for? Diversity, equality, and inclusion. DEI, that is taking the world by storm. Now every major corporation has got an office and a DEI administrator and, and every, it's like everything is run through that office. It doesn't care, it doesn't matter what the policy is, the corporate world, everything is run through the DEI. It sounds good on the surface, but that's not unity. Matter of fact, it, it goes against everything that you and I believe as Christians because uh, in DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, there's no room for Christians. And there's really not a whole lot of room for white males. <laughs> you know, you, 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 no, you, you, it, it is a self-imposed standard that is pushing an agenda, and uh, on surface it sounds great. There's no benefits for hard work or punishment for sloppy work. It only touts inclusion based on a mandated plan. And believe me, there's no room for God. What the church has is a unity that is all about Jesus. 
You lose Jesus in the mix and you have you don't have unity anymore because our unity is in Christ. Oh boy, look at verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effective working and the measure of every part maketh increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. Aren't you glad that's not your new memory verse? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I was in Home Depot. I'm looking at supply lines for a faucet. I noticed somebody was behind me in one of them electric carts, but I'm really not paying attention. I'm trying to make sure I get the right size. Three-eighths, not half-inch. The right length. That cart's not moving. Finally, I, I turned, and he was waiting to talk to me. <laughs> And uh, he just, old gentleman, just began to be very kind to me. And he said, let me give you something. He gave one to you too. Praise the Lord. He's a nice guy. Smile. Jesus Christ loves you more than you know. Well, we had a conversation right there in the aisle. <laughs> and He wanted to know if I was a Christian. I said, yes, and I gave him my testimony. He told me that he had been a chaplain on a cruise line. He said, you know, you're trying to work with people. He said, I believe that's what he said. He, he said, you know, first thing you want to know is, and what denomination are you? And the second thing they want to know is, and what college you go to? He said, the denomination, he said, that's okay, he said, because it means you're in a church and going to church is important. But he said, I used to tell him, you're asking all the wrong questions. You need to ask, have you been saved? Are your sins under the blood? Are you a child of God? He said, you're asking all the wrong questions. And sometimes in the church we can do that. We can get so hung up on, on things. We need to get back to the basics. If there's one body. There's one spirit. There's one hope. There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism. The baptism. There's one Lord God over all. On the back of this it tells people how to get saved. <laughs> He said, now you put this on your refrigerator. He said, and always remember God loves you. <laughs> he said, you need to know that. He said, some days we, you may not feel that God loves you. He said, but God loves you. Well, we had a long talk. I prayed with him right there in the aisle. He prayed for me. Unity happened right there between me and him because of this thing called the Holy Spirit that bears witness my heart, my spirit with his, his spirit with mine. And, and if you meet that guy, it'll happen with you too. Spirit bears witness. You're a child of God. That's called the unity, and it is so important. Paul said, you go out of your way to make sure you protect it, you keep it, you work for it, that you maintain it. We have a glowing testimony of people that come to our church Without fail, they leave and they say, what a friend of the church. Uh, I take that as a compliment. But that is worth, that is worth fighting for, folks. That, that's, you, you don't ever let anything change that would ever change that. It's that important. And Paul said that to a church in Ephesus, and he is still going out to all churches. It is the body of Christ. You protect it because it's important. Yes. Any questions? Perhaps you heard of the family that moved into the neighborhood and the little country church decided to reach out to that family. When they arrived at the doorstep, the members of the church were surprised to find the family had 12 kids 
and they were dirt poor. Well, they invited the family to church and said goodbye, but later that week, the church decided to do something about that family's need. They delivered a package to the family and said, we want you to know that you and your whole family are invited to our church anytime. We brought these gifts, and we hope you're comfortable to receive them and will feel at ease to come to our congregation. We hope you can use them. And they left. The family opened the package and found 14 suits of clothes, beautiful clothes for every member of the family. Sunday came, the congregation waited for the family, and they waited, and they waited, and they waited, and finally church was over, and they never showed up. Wondering what could have happened and what went wrong, after lunch, there were members of the church that went back to that house and found the family who was now just getting back to their house all dressed up in their new clothes. I said, we didn't want to be nosy, but we'd like to know what happened. We had hoped to see you in church this morning, the leader of the church inquired. The father spoke up and said, well, we got up this morning intending to come to your church, and we do appreciate your invitation and the clothes, but after we showered and shaved and got all dressed, we looked so proper, we all went to the Episcopal church. <laughs> Paul said there's one church. If they are born again Christians, their brothers in Christ, their sisters in Christ, let that be the common denominator, the, the melting pot of the church in Christ. Now, there's a lot of other sin issues that we, we can't bend on, but stick to the basics. There's one church. There's one body of Christ. one spirit. Heavenly Father, we pray thanking you for this reminder because Lord, we live in a world that's fractured and splintered. And it seems like the world is doing everything it can to, to just divide us further and further and further from people. Help us, Lord, to get beyond all those lines that's been drawn and minister to people who need Jesus. Father, may we work together as the body of Christ and serve you in a way, in a way that you get the glory. It's not us, it's you. And you grow your church because you said that even the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We pray that in the matchless name of Jesus. And everybody said, Thank you for coming to Wednesday night Bible study. Thank you for being a part of this study. Ephesians 4. We, we've got in there a little ways. We've got more to go, but uh, now you, you see what I was saying. First three chapters, all of theology. The rest is, this is the nuts and bolts of all of how we live it. Jew and Gentile alike. All right, shake hands with one another. Let them know you care about them. Good to see you. Hug their neck if they'll let you. We love you all. <laughs>